Ever since my beloved mother died over a week ago, I have been deeply moved by the outpouring of affection which has accompanied her death. My family and I always knew what she meant for the people of this country and the special place she occupied in the hearts of so many here, in the Commonwealth, and in other parts of the world. But the extent of the tribute that huge numbers of you have paid my mother in the last few days has been overwhelming. I have drawn great comfort from so many individual acts of kindness and respect. Queen Elizabeth II was a woman bound by her duty to the United Kingdom. As the longest reigning monarch in British history, the late Queen put her own life on hold, ensuring she could put country first, remaining the one constant in everyone's life for over 70 years. For 50 of those years, the Queen Mother was by her side, a symbol of the modern royal family. Elizabeth Bowes Lyon was thrust into the public eye after marrying the future king at the age of 23. For the rest of her life, during wartime and peacetime, through love and grief, the Queen Mother's own sense of duty and optimism would offer stability to both the monarchy and the country she served. These characteristics would live on through her daughter, Queen Elizabeth II, and undoubtedly influence her long and prosperous reign. The Honourable Elizabeth Angela Marguerite Bowes Lyon was born at the turn of the 20th century on the 4th of August 1900. She was the youngest daughter and the ninth child of Cecilia Cavendish Bentinck and her husband Claude Bowes Lyon, Lord Glams. When her father became the 14th Earl of Strathmore and Kinghorn in 1904, the future Queen Consort became Lady Elizabeth Bowes Lyon. Lady Elizabeth spent much of her childhood at Glam's Castle, her father's ancestral home in Scotland. Throughout history, the castle had been frequently visited by members of the royal family. Because of this, Lady Elizabeth and her older sisters became good friends with the children of King George V and Queen Mary including Prince Albert. While she was born into nobility, her home education and fondness for field sports, ponies and dogs gave young Elizabeth a relatively normal early life. Her teenage years would, however, be dictated by the increasing tensions across Europe, where new alliances formed, old empires fell, and the threat of war grew ever closer. Lady Elizabeth's 14th birthday was enshrined in the history books for all the wrong reasons. Europe in the late 19th century was a battleground of localized wars and crises. This unrest filtered through into the early 20th century, where subsequent crises and poor diplomacy became the catalyst for war. By 1914, reinforced relations between France, Russia and Great Britain, collectively known as the Triple Entente, 
were directly opposing the Triple Alliance of Germany, Austria-Hungary and Italy. Across the continent, localized crises were beginning to merge. The Great War had begun. It was a birthday that Lady Elizabeth and the rest of the world would never forget. To the clarion call to arms, the country eagerly responded. Everywhere, the nation's manhood flocked to the army in answer to Kitchener's demand for 100,000 recruits. Prominent figures in all walks of life followed the example of George Roby and made stirring appeals for more and yet more men. Four of Lady Elizabeth's brothers were enlisted and served in the army during the Great War. Her elder brother, Fergus, an officer in the Black Watch Regiment, was killed in action in the Battle of Luce in 1915. Back home in Scotland, knowing her brothers were out fighting for their country, Lady Elizabeth was determined to play her part. Glam's castle was turned into a makeshift treatment home for wounded soldiers. Although Lady Elizabeth was too young to work as a nurse, she assisted with welfare work, assisting the patients as much as possible. She got their tobacco from the local shops, wrote letters for them to their loved ones, and played high-spirited games of cards. As well as caring for the troops, Lady Elizabeth also played a significant part in rescuing the castle's contents during a severe fire in 1916. At just 16 years old, she is said to have been instrumental in saving lives and valuables from the castle that could have perished in the fire. The Great War took most of Lady Elizabeth's teenage years away from her. She was forced to grow up quickly and put her duty towards the soldiers she helped care for before herself. After the war, her early childhood friendship with Prince Albert, the Duke of York, would blossom into a relationship. After two years of courtship and several rejected proposals, Lady Elizabeth finally agreed to marry, despite her concerns about royal life. The young couple were married on the 26th of April 1923 in Westminster Abbey. One thousand eight hundred guests attended the ceremony, and crowds lined the streets to see the newest royal couple. Prince Albert arrived, accompanied by Prince Edward, the future king. Meanwhile, Lady Elizabeth arrived with her father and eight bridesmaids, a mix of relatives from both sides of the family. In what became a royal wedding tradition for brides, Lady Elizabeth unexpectedly laid her bouquet at the tomb of the unknown soldier as she walked into the abbey in honor of her brother Fergus. After marriage, Lady Elizabeth became Her Royal Highness the Duchess of York. The Duke and Duchess of York became popular due to their embodiment of the modern royal family. It was unusual for princes not to marry princesses then, so their marriage helped bridge the gap to the general public. Elizabeth even became known as the Smiling Duchess because of her constant expression when engaging with the public on royal visits.
In 1926, the Duchess gave birth to Elizabeth, or Lilibet, as she was known to the family. Unbeknownst to her parents, this little girl would become Britain's longest reigning monarch. In fact, the birth of Lilibet only generated some public interest, as nobody expected that their baby would be the future queen. Edward, heir to the throne at the time, was still young and likely to marry and have children of his own, who would precede Lilibet to the throne. The Duke and Duchess welcomed another girl, Margaret, four years later, into their close-knit family. King George VI, he always referred to himself, his wife and two daughters as us four. They were a royal family within the broader royal family. But because they never anticipated their ranks and their position and their responsibilities changing, they were very much, they anticipated carrying on as being this very close-knit, very loving us four. So Princess Margaret and her sister did have hugely enjoyable and very loving childhood. Ten years after the birth of Lilibet, the royal family was thrust into a constitutional crisis triggered by King George V's death. The king had suffered several bouts of illness since the Great War, much of it exacerbated by his smoking habit. By 1935, he required the use of oxygen tanks by his bedside. On the 20th of January, 1936, his physician issued a bulletin stating, the king's life is moving peacefully towards its close. The king died peacefully at Sandringham House hours after the bulletin had been released. His eldest son Edward, Prince of Wales, became King Edward VIII. However, within 11 months, the king's desire to marry the American divorcee Wallace Simpson resulted in his abdication. His Royal Highness, Prince Edward. But at long last, I am able to say a few words of my own. I have never wanted to withhold anything. But until now, it has not been constitutionally possible for me to speak. But you must believe me when I tell you that I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. And now, we all have the new king. I wish him and you, his people, happiness and prosperity with all my heart. God bless you all. God save the king. Prince Albert, the Duke of York, reluctantly became king in his brother's place on the 11th of December 1936, under the regnal name George VI. The Duchess underwent another name change as she became Queen Elizabeth, the first British-born queen consort since Tudor times. The coronation of the new king and queen took place in May 1937 at Westminster Abbey. Never before has a newly crowned king 
have been able to talk to all his peoples in their own homes on the day of his coronation. And the Queen and I will always keep in our hearts the inspiration of this day. As it often does, history had repeated itself. Like her mother during the Great War, Elizabeth's teenage years were now dictated by her newfound duty. Erwarten, dass mich ihr, meine Jungs und Mädchen, erfüllen, wenn wir in Deutschland der Stärke wünschen, wo müsst ihr eins stark sein, wenn wir in Deutschland der Kraft wollen, so müsst ihr eins kraftvoll sein, wenn das deutsche Volk, das deutsche Reich und unser Reichspräsident General Feldmarschall von Hindeburg heil! 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 Three years after the King and Queen's coronation, war broke out again in Europe. I am speaking to you in the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note, stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking has been received and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. In many respects, the Second World War was a continuation of the disputes left unsettled by the Great War. The armed forces of Hitler's Germany swept without check across Europe in September 1939. With speed and efficiency, the German army successfully invaded Poland. Hitler had long planned an invasion of Poland, a nation that Great Britain had guaranteed military support if attacked by Germany. With no other options, Warsaw surrendered to German troops. Nine days later, the whole country surrendered its resistance and Poland was conquered. With that, Great Britain and France declared war on Germany, beginning the Second World War. In 1940, Norway, Denmark, the Netherlands, Luxembourg and Belgium were captured. Soon after, as they inched closer, the Germans eyed Britain as their next target. The threat of an emerging war to be fought on British shores created a strong and united Britain. Bolstering this unity was a firm role model, the royal family. During the Second World War, the King and Queen became symbols of the fight against fascism. The Queen's Book of the Red Cross was conceived shortly after the war broke out in 1939. 50 authors and artists contributed to the book, fronted by Cecil Beaton's portrait of the Queen and sold in aid of the Red Cross. The cabinet had advised the queen that she and her daughters should evacuate to North America or Canada. To this, the queen famously replied, the children won't go without me, I won't leave the king, and the king will never leave. As the war in Europe got closer to home, bomb shelters were built, pilots were trained, and children were evacuated to relative safety areas. 
nearly one and a half million children had been evacuated in just one week. On royal visits to evacuees, the Queen was often seen comforting and reassuring children, caring for them as any mother would. In London, during 1940 and 1941, the German Luftwaffe began their Blitz campaign. More than 70,000 buildings were demolished, and another 1.7 million were damaged. 20th of September, 1940. Dear Mother, Dad and Audrey, well, how would you feel if you came back home and then there was no home left? That's how I feel at the moment. I suddenly saw that whole thing in ruins and thought, my God, what am I going to do now? I felt incredibly depressed as I walked through the deserted and debris-ridden halls which so lately had teemed with life. I visited the ruined operating theatre where only one short week ago I had done my last operation. The nurse who assisted me at it was killed by one of the bombs. Uh, where were you when the bomb came Well, in bed. Where do you think I was? And, uh... <laughs> what happened? And, uh, what happened to you? Well, it blew me out. It blew you out of bed? It must have blew me out. Oh, well, well, I don't remember no more. You managed to get uh, out of the house all right? Yes. Uh, has it, uh, hurt you at all? Do you feel any effects of it? No, only a bit shook. It's but I had to find my own way out and I was trapped every time and wherever I went. And how do you feel now? About a bit being shaken, I feel all right. Yes. Fine. That's good. The statement made by Mrs. Jiggin is typical of the people in this locality and all over the country. The morale of the people here are wonderful. Well, I can tell you something. <laughs> One of the air raid wardens said to me when I stood over there in my nightdress, and no shoes on my feet. <laughs> he said to me, he said, come along, mother. He said, I'll take you down to the town hall. And I said, what? I said, I don't think it matters, boy. I said, it's my home and I'm going to stick it. He said, that's the spirit, that's what I like to hear. During the Blitz, the King and Queen visited bombed areas to see the damage caused by enemy air raids. On these visits, the Queen took a keen interest in what was being done to help people who had lost their homes. Elizabeth visited troops, hospitals, factories, and parts of London targeted by the German Luftwaffe, particularly the East End near London's docks. We knew they were having a terrible time in the East End, and one heard stories of what was going on, but it didn't seem appropriate or possible to go, to go there. One would have been, I felt one would have been regarded as a sightseer and getting in the way of something that was very difficult for them that they had to get on with. Our shelter was underneath Hubbock's, the paint factory, which is along the shores of the River Thames. And, of course, all paint all overhead, you know, it was the most dangerous place to go, but it was underground. We was at least underground. And we was there for, oh, a couple of years, I think. Her visits initially provoked hostility. Rubbish was thrown at her, and the crowds jeered partly because she wore expensive clothes that seemingly alienated her from people suffering the deprivations of war. She explained that if the public came to see her, they would wear their best clothes, so she should reciprocate in kind. In September 1940, Buckingham Palace was damaged by German bombs. On one occasion, the King and Queen had been merely 100 yards away from the Royal Chapel when a bomb destroyed it. 
After, she said, I'm glad we have been bombed. It makes me feel I can look the East End in the face. Even when she was the target of German bombs, Queen Elizabeth was resolute in her decision to stay at Buckingham Palace and stand with the people of Great Britain. Thousands of you in this country have had to leave your home and be separated from your fathers and mothers. My sister Margaret Rose and I feel so much for you, as we know from experience what it means to be away from those we love most of all. I want, on behalf of all the children at home, to send you our love and best wishes to you and to your kind hosts as well. My sister is by my side, and we are both going to say good night to you. Come on, Margaret. Good night, children. Good night, and good luck to you all. The Queen's determination to stand up to Hitler's fascist regime made the German Fuhrer furious. Hitler referred to the Queen as the most dangerous woman in Europe as he watched her and King George VI keep British hopes alive by remaining in Buckingham Palace despite bombs raining down on London. It is undeniable that the combination of the King and Queen's dutiful stoicism and Winston Churchill's leadership fueled the fire of the British people's unity and resolve during the Second World War. After having inspired the armies under his command abroad to fight victoriously in Libya, Tunisia, Sicily, General Montgomery makes a visit to various war factories to stimulate those at home. Why is it that today the, the tide has turned and we are beating the Germans and coming towards the final climax of the war? I'll tell you why it is. It's because we've got far the best equipment and we've got far the best men and women too. Far the best. I can tell you that our British equipment is far superior to the equipment of the enemy because I've seen both. I know ours and I've seen the enemies and it's very, very good. Now, the great thing when you go fighting, of course, my business, as you know, is fighting. Fighting the Germans. Oh, anybody else, too, who wants to have a fight. <laughs> the only uncertain thing now is when the war is going to end. When? Well, you can choose your own date and put the money on. I got some money on. I won't tell you my date. <laughs> But there's, there's no shadow of doubt, no shadow of doubt that this war is going to end in the only proper way, the only proper way, and in none other. The battlefront and the home front. Really get down to it this year. We can get the thing almost finished. We can get it so tight that next year we just topple it over. And the home front, I would say, very delighted. We know each other. Between us, we can do anything and will. We will do anything. In the early hours of the 7th of May, 1945, representatives from the Allied High Command accepted the surrender of Nazi Germany. Yesterday morning, at 2.41 a.m. at General Eisenhower's headquarters, General Jodl, the representative of the German High Command and of Grand Admiral Dönitz, the designated head of the German state, signed the act of unconditional surrender of all German land, sea, and air forces in Europe to the Allied Expeditionary Forces and simultaneously to the Soviet High Command. Uh, hostilities will end officially at one minute after midnight tonight, Tuesday the 8th of May. 
we may allow ourselves a brief period of rejoicing. Today is victory in Europe Day. Tomorrow will also be victory in Europe Day. She has inflicted upon Great Britain, the United States and other countries, and her detestable cruelties call for justice and retribution. We must now devote all our strength and resources to the completion of our tasks, both at home and abroad. Advance Britannia. Long live the cause of freedom. God save the King. The largest and bloodiest war in history was finally over. Victory worldwide was celebrated and returning soldiers were given heroes' welcomes. Post-war, the King and Queen continued their duties at home and abroad. The couple's popularity bolstered by their wartime efforts would only increase even when the Queen's usual friendly manner was tested whilst on tour in South Africa. During the 1947 Royal Tour, the Royal Procession wound through 20,000 cheering tribesmen. A giant Zulu warrior burst from the crowd and sprinted straight for the Royal Car. As he shrugged off police bodyguards, he reached into the King and Queen's car with a closed fist, only to be beaten back by Queen Elizabeth, who broke her parasol in two on his head. When the stunned man was picked up off the road, officials found he was no terrorist, but had a 10-shilling note clutched in his hand, a 21st birthday present for Princess Elizabeth. Unfortunately, the joy of their post-war royal journey wouldn't last long. By 1951, some royal tours were suspended or adapted due to the king's diminishing health. Queen Elizabeth's life changed dramatically the following year when her husband died. The king's health deteriorated after a lung operation in 1951 and he finally succumbed to his ailments in February 1952. Immediately after, his first-born daughter, Elizabeth, became Queen Elizabeth II. For an entire year after the death of King George VI, the Queen Mother wore black as she mourned his loss. Through the London streets, where so often the eager crowds had cheered, the procession wends its silent way. This is London's day of mourning. Across Trafalgar Square towards Whitehall, to the right leads the road to the palace, which will see him no more. Today, the king rides down Whitehall towards Westminster. The queen, Margaret, and the queen mother bonded very closely after the death of their father and husband. They were united in grief. The Queen Mother, as she was newly styled, did everything in her power to ensure that her daughter's transition to the throne was smooth. The grief of losing her husband, coupled with the loss of her role, left her feeling alone and without purpose. She soon decided to retire from her public role and move away from the public eye to Scotland. 
the persuasive words of the newly re-elected Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, convinced her that she could not exist in a permanent state of mourning. The Queen needed her mother's support, so she broke her retirement and resumed her public duties. In fact, after returning from Scotland, the Queen Mother's duties made her just as, if not more busy than she had been as Queen Consort. She continued to travel extensively throughout the mid-20th century after returning to her role, including over 40 official visits overseas. In July 1953, merely a year after the death of King George VI, she undertook her first overseas visit since the funeral when she visited the Federation of Rhodesia and Nyasaland with Princess Margaret. During her daughter's extensive tour of the Commonwealth in 1953 and 1954, the Queen Mother acted as a counselor of state and looked after her grandchildren. Whilst there was no official role for the Queen Mother, she nonetheless played a significant part in representing her family and country. The Queen Mother was the patron or president of some 350 organizations. She was commander-in-chief of the Army and Air Force Women's Services and for women in the Royal Navy. For many years, she was president of the British Red Cross Society and was Commander-in-Chief of the Nursing Division of the St. John Ambulance Brigade. She was also Colonel-in-Chief or Honorary Colonel of many UK and overseas regiments and Commander-in-Chief of the Royal Air Force Central Flying School. 200 years have wrought an immense transformation in the civilization of the world. But I think we may take pride and comfort from one thing. With the vast changes that the centuries have seen, the universities of the free world grow and flourish as never before. There was certainly a chance here if the horse could stay on in the run-in. The professional calculated the possibility. Injuries and illnesses surrounded the Queen Mother's later life, alluding to her ever-increasing frailty. Only hours later, she braved the freezing weather to visit the royal stud on the Sandringham estate, where she fell and fractured her left hip. She was taken to King Edward VII Hospital in London. Well-wishers arrived with flowers this morning after hearing news of the successful hip replacement operation last night that complications can follow this type of surgery. The reality is that the Queen Mother will be at risk of having a thrombosis, a blood clot travelling to the lung, and a fatal pulmonary embolism, or even a heart attack. The complications following hip surgery actually account for as many as one in four deaths. She's obviously what we would call a biological survivor. She is a brave lady, and she's done extraordinarily well. And she's got a certain tenacity, a certain amount of fight about her, which is one of the factors, I think, which has endeared her to the country's heart. Outside the hospital, where the 97-year-old Queen Mother is now recovering, her most devoted admirers have a message for her we can all subscribe to. Get well soon and be back for your 98th. After her grand centenary birthday celebration in November 2000, she broke her collarbone in a fall that kept her recuperating at home over Christmas and the New Year. Hitler called her the most dangerous woman in Europe. It was a tribute to a queen whose visits to a devastated East End did so much to maintain wartime morale. Now, more than half a century later, the bond she established then with ordinary people remains. During the war, we have done what you had to do, patch up the houses and windows and all that. And the Queen who's come down to the East End, her husband, and when you see you just, you know, you come alive again, you know what I mean? She makes me feel comfortable inside. Not on her, uh, you know. She makes me feel as if I've known her years and years. She's like a mother. 
reminds me of my mother. On the 1st of August 2001, Elizabeth had a blood transfusion for anemia after suffering from mild heat exhaustion. However, she was well enough to make her traditional appearance outside Clarence House three days later to celebrate her 101st birthday. The Queen Mother joined by her family to celebrate her 101st birthday on the 4th of August. Just three days before, she'd had a blood transfusion in hospital after suffering from anemia. As ever, she was determined not to let age diminish her ability to carry out engagements and thrill the crowds. The advancing years, insisting that she could walk unaided to her seat to witness a pageant great-grandmother who throughout her long life remained at the heart of the nation's affections. Her final public engagements included planting a cross at the Field of Remembrance on the 8th of November 2001, a reception at the Guildhall London for reforming the 600 Squadron Royal Auxiliary Air Force on the 15th of November, and attending the recommission of HMS Ark Royal on the 22nd of November. She is a wonderful ship, and I hope we'll all be very happy in her. And I would like also to give my very best wishes to the ship's company and to those at Resize who helped so much. And now, Captain Selson, splice the main brace. <laughs> <laughs> The tragedy of the Queen Mother's longevity was undoubtedly outliving her daughter, Princess Margaret. In 2002, Margaret suffered her fourth stroke, which proved fatal. She was still determined to attend Margaret's funeral at St George's Chapel, Windsor Castle. And I think it's very important, in a sense, that she carries through what she wants to do. Because if, for example, she didn't make it to the funeral, and let's be quite clear about this. This isn't just the funeral of her daughter. This is the 50th anniversary of the funeral of her husband, the late king. On the 5th of March, 2002, the Queen Mother was present at the luncheon of the annual lawn party of the Eton Beagles. However, her health began to deteriorate increasingly during her last weeks. On the 30th of March, 2002, she died at the Royal Lodge, Windsor Great Park, with her surviving daughter, Queen Elizabeth II, at her bedside. Within two months, the Queen had lost her only sister and her mother, two of the most important and influential people in her life. Over the years, I have met many people who have had to cope with family loss, sometimes in the most tragic of circumstances. So I count myself fortunate that my mother was blessed with a long and happy life. She had an infectious zest for living, and this remained with her until the very end. At the ceremony tomorrow, I hope that sadness will blend with a wider sense of thanksgiving not just for her life, but for the times in which she lived. A century for this country and the Commonwealth, not without its trials and sorrows, but also one of extraordinary progress, full of examples of courage and service, as well as fun and laughter. This is what my mother would have understood, because it was the warmth and affection of people everywhere which inspired her resolve, dedication, and enthusiasm for life. I thank you for the support you are giving me and my family as we come to terms with her death and the void she has left in our midst. I thank you also from my heart for the love you gave her during her life 
and the honor you now give her in death. May God bless you all. The queen followed in her mother's footsteps as a monarch bound by her role and entirely focused on her commitment to the British people for over 70 incredible years. It is undoubtedly the Queen Mother's sense of duty that had the most significant impact on Queen Elizabeth II's long and prosperous reign.